हेलो एवरीवन एंड वेलकम टू इकोनॉमिक सर्वे 2021-22 लेक्चर सीरीज नाउ दिस ईयर द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया हैज ब्रॉट आउट ओनली वन एडिशन ऑफ इकोनॉमिक सर्वे प्रीवियसली द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया यूज टू ब्रिंग आउट टू वॉल्यूम्स ऑफ इकोनॉमिक सर्वे वॉल्यूम वन यूज टू टॉक अबाउट द कॉन्सेप्ट रिलेटेड टू द पॉलिसीज एंड द स्कीम्स लॉन्च बाई गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इट वॉज वेरी कॉन्सेप्चुअल इन नेचर and volume 2 used to be like a report card of the indian economy where they used to give a lot of data and do an assessment of how the economic performance has been but this year volume 1 has been done away with and only volume 2 has been published as economic survey so there will be only one book of economic survey this year now we are going to have this series of lectures to analyze the economic survey from the perspective of upsc so guys this is how economic survey looks like this year see so it says economic survey 2021 22 and and these are the important areas which have been covered in the economic survey even if we have not read the survey but if you look at the the cover of the economic survey you would realize that so so there is something very interesting here see so there is a doctor who is holding vaccine in his hand and he is running after people so vaccination is one of the major objectives of government of india we are looking for a booster dose right now look at this metro which means infrastructure then you have this satellites which means things related to space so so roads government of india has has put a lot of emphasis on road construction so these are some of the things that are the highlights of this year's economic survey so guys if i have to give you a a plan for how to cover economic survey this year i would suggest that we should we should divide the entire economic survey into different boxes for example so there are 11 chapters in the economic survey this year usually uh, volume 2 of economic economic survey used to have 10 chapters but this year there is one more chapter here now the first set of chapters that i would prescribe you to read from economic surveys chapter number 1 state of the economy chapter number 2 price and inflation chapter number 3 external sector these three chapters should be read one after another in continuity they are basically about the economic performance in overall macro sense then you should come to chapter number 2 and 4 chapter 2 is fiscal policy chapter 4 is monetary policy whenever you have to frame policies for an economy these two are the most important pillars to frame policies fiscal policy monetary policy so these two should be read together then you have the performance of different sectors of the indian economy for example chapter number 7 talks about agriculture and food management chapter number 8 industry infrastructure and chapter number 9 services these three are are one of the most important blocks of the economic survey because these three are about different sectors of the economy agriculture industry and infrastructure and services then you have two more chapters chapter number 6 and chapter number 10 chapter number 6 talks about sustainable development and climate change and chapter number 10 social infrastructure and employment these two should be read together and then you have chapter number 11 which is an extra miscellaneous chapter this year it talks about tracking development through satellite images and cartography so they have used satellite images to assess what has been the level of development in different things like banking like infrastructure and all these things so this is how you can divide this year's economic survey into different set of topics and it would be easy to understand the survey if you follow this approach now the first topic that we are going to cover in the series of economic survey lectures is chapter number 1 which is state of the economy in a very simple way if i have to describe what is the content of this chapter i would say this chapter talks about the report card of indian economy in very simple terms fine so let us see how this chapter is now if you remember our last year's economic survey series lectures whenever we used to start a particular topic we used to start it with a chapter layout and the chapter plan this year also whenever we start a topic the first thing that we will do is we will have a chapter layout and a plan 
This gives a clear picture of what is going to come in that topic. Fine. So this is your first chapter called as state of the economy. We can divide this chapter into four very, very crucial parts, into four parts, right? The first part of this chapter would talk about theme of the economic survey this year. And what are we going to study under the theme of economic survey? So the first thing that we will study is something called as agile approach, right? It's a very popular term these days, a lot of uh, newspapers, a lot of news channels, everybody is talking about agile approach. The second important part in the theme is barbell strategy. These two are related, agile approach and barbell strategy are related. Now, the next important pillar of, of the first chapter is economic revival policies. So this is the theme and this section is going to talk about what steps have been taken by government of India during the time of COVID to help the economy come out of crisis. What steps have been taken? So all these things are called as economic revival policies that we will study under this section. The third section of economic survey would talk about the report card of the Indian economy. Here we will talk about some trends, some data and we would capture the overall performance of the Indian economy. So here we are going to study something about vaccination, then sectoral trend, which means the trend of agriculture, industry, services, infrastructure and all those things. Then macro stability. Here we are going to look at some macroeconomic indicators, for example, inflation, for example, balance of payment, right? Uh, the performance of financial sector and all these things, we are going to look in the macroeconomic stability. Then we are going to look at two very, very important things for an economy. First is demand and second is supply, right? Because this demand and supply would determine how well an economy is performing in a normal sense. See, all of us are consumers, right? We buy different things to survive food, clothes, house, etc, etc. If we stop buying, what will happen to the industrialist? If I don't buy this bottle of water, what will happen to the industry which is manufacturing it? Of course, they will shut down, they will suffer from losses. So if there is no demand and there is no supply, what happens in the economy? The economy stagnates and there is a crisis. So one of the ways to find out if there is crisis in the economy or the economy is behaving in a normal manner is to look at demand and look at supply. If both, both these things are normal, I can assume, safely assume, that economy is behaving in a normal sense. So in today's lecture, we will examine it, all right? And if there is any problem related to demand and supply, it is the responsibility of the policy makers to give suggestions of how to revive demand, how to revive supply. So that we are going to learn in this topic. The next important part and which is a unique part in chapter number one of economic survey this year is a comparison between global financial crisis, tapered tantrum and COVID related crisis. So global financial crisis 2008-9, tapered tantrum 2013, COVID crisis 2020-2021 and 2022. We are going to compare these three different type of crisis situations and we are going to see how similar or how different these three crisis situations are compared to each other. Fine. So this I find to be to be one of the most interesting things of chapter number one in this year's economic survey. Now see one of the last parts of of chapter number one talks about growth outlook of the Indian economy. So what has been the growth pattern? So first of all, we are going to examine whether Indian economy is showing V-shaped recovery, the very famous V-shaped recovery or not. So because there are some economists who say that Indian economy has been, you know, showing signs of K-shaped recovery, V-shaped recovery, W-shaped recovery. So we will see what economic survey is saying, all right. Then, the last part of, of chapter number one would talk about future projections of Indian economy. So how is Indian economy expected to behave and grow over next one year or two years? This is given in this part. So this last part which talks about growth outlook, they would first talk about have we recovered from the crisis and to what extent have we recovered? And it also talks about what is the future of Indian economy? 
all right so this is how the chapter plan can be can be studied under four different heads all right guys so now let us look at an example of barbell strategy and agile approach in case of india you see when india started to suffer from covid related crisis the first thing as i told you the first thing that india suffered was a health crisis right because of health crisis india reacted in certain way for example lockdown for example some kind of restrictions factories were shut and everything became standstill and india started to suffer from economic crisis also so see started with covid crisis first we faced health crisis it was followed by economic crisis it was a big challenge for the policy makers now why because we were suffering from twin crisis health and economic crisis so it's a big challenge for the policy makers that what kind of policy should india formulate now why is this a big challenge it's a big challenge because there was one wave after another and we could not predict what is going to happen next so whenever there is uncertainty that is this the last wave or are we going to have another wave after this and what is the nature of the next variant of covid nobody had an idea how long there will be lockdown there is no idea when you have uncertainty confusion chaos all around how do you make economic policies in such a scenario so conventionally the the model of economic policy that is being followed in india since the days of five year plans is called as a waterfall approach this is the method this is the kind of policy approach that we had adopted now this waterfall approach is not a very great approach when you are making policies in uncertain situation in uncertain circumstances and situation as i had told you some time back that one of the best ways to create policy is barbell strategy where you follow agile approach right so that's your approach but before we we look at an example of of what india did in barbell and agile let us look what is the meaning of waterfall approach and how is it different from barbell strategy or agile approach only then are we going to understand basically how india applied agile approach in the economic planning in the context of covid so to give you a clear picture so that we understand the difference in the concept of waterfall and agile we have taken an example here so see <clears throat> now assume guys that when covid problem started in 2020 the government of india would called would have called a meeting in the niti aayog office where all the policy makers and and all the experts would have sat together and they would have decided that okay now that covid has come in the economy from newspaper reports from reports of of different countries and and the medical team all these reports would have been in front of the government and the government would have said at that time suppose this would have been done by the government so in 2020 the government would have said in the month of march that now we have all the data all the information related to covid and the government would have made an assumption that whatever is going to happen related to covid the government already knows it suppose the government would have started the policy making with this assumption in the month of march 2020 which means what is the initial assumption of the government that we know what is covid what will happen because of covid if the government would has would have assumed this that they know everything related to covid then government would have created a policy that okay since we already know what is going to happen we can predict future so this is the policy that india should follow and the government would have given this set of policies to different ministries and departments and different departments would have implemented that policy now in this case the government is creating the policy with an assumption that they know everything and then they are implementing it word by word there is no mechanism of taking feedback from anybody there is no mechanism of readjustment of policy or changing the policy midway so if government implements a policy and it needs to be changed midway after a few days there was no mechanism to do it this approach is called as a waterfall approach in waterfall approach the basic assumption is we already know what is going to happen we create a policy we implement the policy and we are rigid we don't change it we don't take feedbacks right so what could be disastrous in case of waterfall approach if we adopt that policy in case of covid kind of situation i'll give you an example so suppose guys in the covid case 
the government of india as i told you in niti ayog would have sat and would have decided that oh this is covid kind of situation in covid situation people don't have income they are suffering from health crisis so the policy makers would have said that okay people are suffering from crisis they don't have income they have lost their job let us give cash to people and government of india would have started to give cash to everybody all right to everyone government of india would have started to give cash during a covid situation the government of india would have given so much of cash that people would have started to demand a lot of things in the economy so suppose guys this is the beginning of covid and the government said we know what will happen in covid people will run out of cash because they are spending money in healthcare etc so they need money let us give money to people so i am a normal citizen of india suppose i have cash in my hand what will i do i will keep some cash as reserve for bad days rest of the cash i am going to spend in the market when i going to, when i am going to spend cash in the market i will demand a lot of goods for example laptop mobile phone etc etc and the government would say that wow great see economy is working fine and then the government would have not looked into what is actually happening in the economy what is actually happening in the economy when a lot of cash is given to people when they demand a lot of things there must be a factory to supply those things but suppose during a covid guys factories know that during covid they are not going to get raw material right so factories won't be able to operate plus there is a lockdown after the covid so factories are anyways not operating if your factories are not operating and your aggregate supply is very low in the economy but if you give too much of cash to people your demand will be greater than supply so it is like saying that there is just one water bottle in the economy and everybody has money and everybody is demanding this bottle what will happen price will go up during covid the production of this bottle production of goods and services were low but demand would have been very high if people would have got a lot of cash this would lead to inflation but our policy makers in waterfall approach would not look into all this why because according to them they already know everything and there is no need to change feedback from anybody and they would just implement this policy where lot of cash would be given to people now imagine what will happen covid situation cash in the hand of people no production inflation it might turn into hyperinflation and economy would leave, you know get into a situation a kind of trap from where it is very difficult to come out this would have been the case if we would have followed a waterfall approach what is the contrary of waterfall approach what is the other side of waterfall approach which india followed india followed barbell strategy or agile approach what is barbell strategy and agile approach in this case it's it's a very interesting thing so you see what did we do the government of india started to collect data data related to what data related to macro economic indicators for example data related to industrial output data related to inflation gst collection cargo movement power consumption these kind of data are called as high frequency data so the government of india has started to collect 80 high frequency data 80 high frequency indicators data related to 80 high frequency indicators now guys if you are the government imagine you are collecting data related to industrial output and if you see that the industrial output is very low in the economy what would you feel you would feel that supply of goods and services in the economy is low if you see that gst collection is very low in the economy what would you conclude if you are a policy maker so who who files gst the industries industries the manufacturing units right the service providers so if your industries are shut service providers are not giving any services what will be the gst collection very low similarly if you see that the movement of cargo cargo means goods in the economy is very low it means industries are not manufacturing similarly if you see that power consumption consumption of electricity is very low in the economy it means your factories are not running so if you see that these indicators are giving you a negative picture and you are a policy maker you use this data to create a policy and then you realize that oh these factories are not producing anything our gst collection is very low etc etc it means that supply of goods and services in the economy is low in this case you cannot give too much of money in everybody's hand because then everybody will demand a lot of goods supply of goods is not there inflation will happen 
So under agile approach, you collect data. Then based on that data, you formulate a policy. What policy did you formulate? Instead of increasing demand in the economy, you should increase supply first, which means you should try to motivate the industries, MSMEs, small industries to manufacture more, give them more incentives, give more incentives to MSMEs so that they can manufacture more and they can also create jobs. Once you give incentive to MSMEs so that they will manufacture more, they will create jobs. Don't forget, you have another section in the society called vulnerable section, which means below the poverty line people, women, elderly, you know, divyangs. You have to take care of this population also. You have to give them food, shelter, you have to give them medicines. So along with helping your MSMEs, you have to provide safety net to the society. So, so what did you do? If you are the government, you collected data. From data, you realize that production in the economy is very low. So you start to take supply side steps. Why? Because you, have, you want the industries to supply more goods and services. So you try to give incentive to MSMEs so that they will increase the supply. When your MSMEs are working fine, there is a complaint from the economy that below poverty line people, women, children, elder, they are not getting food, clothes, they are not getting houses, they are not getting medicines, right? So you get a feedback. If you are the government, this feedback will reach you and then you will provide something called as safety net to poor, which means you will give, give food, medicine, clothes, houses to poor. So you are doing two things. You are giving incentive to industries. You are also giving support to poor, right? So these two set of policies you are doing based on data collection. So this entire thing that you see is a part of barbell strategy where you are following agile approach. What is agile approach? Government makes policy based on data. Then government implements the policy. Government takes the feedback. If the feedback gives some new ideas, the government implements it. This is agility. This is agile approach. This is what we have done in India. Fine. So let me let me show you overall what we have done. So in India, we have followed barbell strategy to help the economy come out of crisis. What is barbell strategy in India? There are two, two pillars of barbell strategy, agile approach and safety net. I told you what is agile approach. In agile approach, you collect data, you implement policy, then you take feedback and after feedback, if it is required, you readjust your policy as simple as that. That is your agile approach. One of the limitations of agile approach is in agile approach, you have to collect data. Data collection is a very difficult thing, right? Especially in a developing country like India, you need agencies to collect perfect data. So this could be one of the challenges. Another challenge of agile approach, this could be asked in the exam, right? What are the challenges of agile approach? Another challenge of agile approach is in this agile approach, there is no way that you can predict future. For example, if government collects data, implements a policy, takes a feedback, if policy is good, very nice. If it is not good, change the policy. But government cannot predict the future that what will happen to India after two years, five years and 10 years because we cannot predict COVID, simple, right? So when government of India starts to help MSMEs, I told you that government of India starts to help MSMEs after looking at data to increase the supply in the economy. Then we, we realize that if you help MSMEs, you cannot leave the poor section behind, right? So along with helping your MSMEs, you must give safety net to your poor because you cannot predict for how long COVID will, you know, uh, create problems for the economy, for how long there will be lockdown, etc. You cannot predict. Hence, you have to take care of your vulnerable section. This is your second strategy under under barbell strategy that you should provide some safety net some security to the vulnerable and the poor section so two things you are doing you are following agile approach where you are looking at data and implementing policies in the agile approach you collect a lot of data high frequency indicators but agile approach cannot predict future it cannot tell you how long economy is going to be in crisis just because you cannot predict future so you have to take care of your vulnerable section poor section so you use safety nets. Fine, this is your barbell strategy and this is your agile approach.
Now, uh, let's, let's see what questions can be asked in UPSC from this topic. So, discuss how India implemented barbell strategy or the second question could be discuss safety net measures to prevent COVID related distress. So, they are asking, so, so for example, you know what they are asking, they are asking you how did India implement barbell strategy so that economy could come out of crisis. How will you write an answer guys? First, you should write this framework. All right. This framework says COVID and India's barbell strategy. There are two pillars of barbell strategy of India. One is agile approach. I already told you. In agile approach, the government collects high frequency indicators, 80 high frequency indicators. Based on the indicator, we create policy and then we take feedback. And if needed, we change the policy. But along with this, we also take care of the vulnerable and the poor section of the society. This is called as safety net. So, so what are the safety net measures, some of the safety net measures that the government of India has taken so far under barbell strategy. So, for example, cash transfer, skill, MSME, you know, credit, employment, housing and RBI's monetary policy. These are the things that we have done as a part of barbell strategy. Let me give you some examples of, of safety net measures. See, some safety net measures. You see, the first safety net measure has been taken by government of India to give more credit to people in the society. How, how did the government of India give more credit to people in the society? So, so for example, to the farmers, the government of India has extended and continued to give 6,000 rupees a year in three installments under a scheme called as PM Kisan. Under PM Kisan, the government gives 6,000 rupees per year to the farmers in three installments. Similarly, to the women, the government of India is giving 500 rupees a month for three months in their Jandhan accounts. JDA is Jandhan accounts. And, and for vulnerable section like widow, divyang, elder, the government is giving 1000 rupees. This is an example of how the government is giving credit during the time of COVID. It is a safety net measure. Second is food security, guys. So in food security, let me tell you what the government is doing. Number one. We already have something called as National Food Security Act. And by the way, this question was already asked in UPSC mains this year, where UPSC asked you what is National Food Security Act. Under National Food Security Act, the government of India provides 5 kilogram of ration or food grains per person per month, you know, rice, wheat and cereals at rupees 3 a kg, rupees 2 a kg and rupees 1 a kg. Right? So, for example, rice rupees 3 a kg, wheat rupees 2 a kg, so something like that. 5 kg food grains are provided to people who need it. Right? Then 35 kg of, of food grains are provided per family per month to those people who are extremely poor. So, there are people who are poor in India. Then there are people who are poorest of the poor, extremely poor. So they are called as Antyode Anna Yojana group, AAY, Antyode Anna Yojana. To those, those population who are extremely poor, poorest of the poor, the government gives 35 kilogram food grain per family per month. This government of India already gives under National Food Security Act. But when COVID happened, the government of India said that we will give you 5 kg per person per month free food grains to all those people who are covered under National Food Security Act, which means if somebody is getting 5 kilogram of rice, wheat and other cereals, that person will, so at 3 rupees, 2 rupees and 1 rupees, the person will also get 5 kilogram of free food along with 5 kilogram of paid food, you get 5 kilogram of free food. Antyode Anna Yojana, they are already getting 35 kilogram of food. They will get now 40 kilogram of food under Antyode Anna Yojana. 5 kg has been added here free of cost. That is under Atmanirbhar Bharat. All right. Why is it being given? Because government of India is providing safety net to poor people. Now, under one ration, one card, this is a very interesting scheme which government of India is providing you know, food security to people. So guys, suppose that I am a worker from Madhya Pradesh. Suppose I belong to Bhopal. So since I belong to Bhopal, I have a ration card. I can use this ration card to get subsidized food in my state, from my state government in Bhopal. Now suppose I am a migrant worker. I come to Delhi to work in a construction company. 
I am a laborer, daily wage laborer. When I come to Delhi, I want to use my ration card, Madhya Pradesh ration card, Bhopal ration card in Delhi. Can I get food grains using that ration card? No. Because the government of Delhi would say, go to Madhya Pradesh because your ration card belongs to Madhya Pradesh. So the government of India said, we should not do this because there is a lot of internal migration in India. So the government of India created a scheme called as One Nation, One Ration Card. Right? See? Under it, if I have a ration card from one state, for example, let's say Madhya Pradesh, Bhopal, and if I come to Delhi, I am a migrant worker, I can get food grains even in Delhi using that same ration card. So that is being done in India now. Similarly, guys, you have Ujjwala Yojana. You know, Ujjwala Yojana was started by government of India in the year 2016 to give free LPG cylinders to below poverty line women in India. And in 2016, 2016, the government of India said they will distribute 5 crore LPG cylinders to below poverty line women. Later on, the government of India increased the numbers and they gave it to 8 crore women. And currently the government of India, because of COVID, is saying that they will give three free, in fact, they have already given three free cooking gas cylinder to eight crore beneficiaries, which means below poverty line women, plus free refill. So the government of India is giving three, you know, LPG cylinders to below poverty line women, plus the government of India is also giving free refill. And the government is giving it to eight crore beneficiaries. In fact, it came in the newspapers very recently that government of India is going to give it to 1 crore extra, which means total 9 crore people now. Instead of 8 crore beneficiaries, 8 crore below poverty line women, the government is saying we will give it to 9 crore now. So it has changed already. Now, what about employment? What is government of India doing for employment? So for employment, the government of India has increased the minimum wage rate under Manrega across the states. That's the first thing. Second, you see, to, to explain the second thing, I have to give you an example. So guys, suppose that you join a job. Whenever you join a job, you will get a salary. So suppose you join a job, you get a salary of 100 rupees. You know, if your salary is 100 rupees, suppose you work for me, right? I am the owner of a company. You work for me. I am giving you a salary of 100 rupees. The moment I give you a salary of 100 rupees, if I am the owner, I have to take 12 rupees from my pocket, 12%. If you are my worker, you have to take 12 rupees from your pocket. So I will contribute 12, you will contribute 12. Together, 24 rupees will be taken. So if your salary is 100, 24% of your salary, 24 rupees is taken and 24 rupees is put in something called as provident fund accounts. When you retire, in my company, you will retire one day. When you retire, you will be returned back this 24 rupees. So whatever be your salary, 12% of your salary is contributed by owner of the company, 12% will be contributed by you, total 24% will be put in the provident fund account. And when you retire, we will give you money from this account. Now the government of India is telling all the industrialists and all the factory owners and all the people that don't kick out employees. I know this is COVID time, you are making losses, your factory is not running. So the government of India is trying to motivate different companies, different manufacturers, different factories, not to reduce employment. And government of India is doing it under Atmanirbhar Bharat Rojgar Yojana. What is, what is government doing here? Motivating the companies not to, you know, not to fire people. And the government of India is telling this, that whenever somebody earns an income of 100 rupees, I told you that 12 rupees will be contributed by the owner of the industry and 12 rupees will be contributed by the employee, right? So government is saying, we are going to take the burden of provident fund. Whenever somebody earns 100 rupees during COVID, government is going to give 12 rupees on the behalf of employer, which means owner, and government is going to give 12 rupees on the behalf of employee, which means worker. So 24 rupees will be given by government of India in the provident fund of people which means there is going to be zero burden on employer, zero burden on employee. This is what the government of India is doing. This is how it is motivating the industries to increase employment. All right. Now, housing for all. This is very, very basic thing. Everybody requires food, clothing and shelter. So the government of India has a motto. It says housing for all by 2022. So the government of India is providing funds to urban people and rural people 
at subsidized interest rate government is giving them loan at low interest rate so that people can construct affordable house in urban area affordable house in rural area and the government of india wants to construct almost 20 million houses by the year 2022 this is called as housing for all 20 million houses by the year 2022 fine and 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 which scheme are we using to create 20 million houses pradhan mantri avas yojana it is called as pradhan mantri avas yojana urban and pradhan mantri avas yojana rural now for skill development what is government of india doing for skill development you see there are two things that the government is doing specifically in the context of covid number one you know there are a lot of people who migrate from rural areas to urban areas and they work in places like Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore, Kolkata, right? So for example, let's say guys that I belong to, let's say I belong to UP, I belong to Kanpur and I have come to Delhi to work as a construction worker, right? During COVID what happened? I go back to my village in Kanpur and when I go back, there is no employment for me, right? So the government of India said that those migrants who have returned back, they must be given new skill or their old skill must be polished. So the government started a scheme called as Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana to provide skill to migrants who have returned back. Similarly, the government of India says that if you go to rural areas, you will find very talented young population youth there. But the sad thing is they are poor. They belong to poverty class, right? So below poverty line or they are poor strata of the society. So the government says if you are a young person, but you are a poor guy, you need opportunities. So the government of India says that under Deen Dayal Upadhyay Gramin Kaushal Yojana, the government will provide you skill so that you can become self-employed. So it is for poor young people from rural areas. And Ministry of Rural Development is running this scheme. What is the government doing for MSME sector, guys? So you see, there is, there is a lot of job creation that happens by micro, small and medium enterprises, right? And, and these are the backbone of the Indian economy. But they are not very big industries. So the government said that during COVID, we will help you. How? Look at this bank. Or I'm going to tell you a story of what government is doing. Look at this bank. And look at this industry called MSME, micro, small and medium enterprises. What is this MSME doing? For example, this MSME is manufacturing water bottles like this. For example, right. What is government doing? So the government of India said that we are going to come and check what is the status of this MSME. So suppose this micro, small and medium enterprise has taken 12 lakh rupees loan from this bank. Guys, to manufacture this water bottle, this MSME definitely requires capital, right? MSME is not a very rich company. It's a very small kind of company. And to manufacture these water bottles, they need cash, they need capital. So this MSME took 12 lakh rupees loan from this bank at 3% rate of interest. Now every month, and, and, and this MSME took this loan for one year only. Now every month, this MSME has to provide an EMI of 1 lakh rupees to the bank along with rate of interest. That is the agreement between bank and MSME. That these MSMEs have taken loan of 12 lakh rupees for one year, 3% rate of interest. Now they have to give back 1 lakh rupees every month along with interest rate. Unfortunately, during COVID, what has happened is many of these MSMEs have not been able to return either the EMI or the interest rate to the bank. Now, if you don't return EMI and interest rate to a bank for 90 days, right, three months, then this loan is called as non-performing asset. Because this is a loan which is like a dead loan for the bank because this loan is neither coming back nor the bank is getting interest. So bank calls it, it as non-performing asset. And if you don't return the loan of the bank, bank is going to send recovery agents at your place, in your office, at your home, right? So the government of India said that no, don't do this because this is a COVID time, extraordinary crisis situation. If somebody is not able to return your money for three months, don't call it as NPA, call it as normal loan only for some time. So this scheme is called as restructuring because government of India is restructuring the NPAs and calling it as normal loans only, right? So this is happening for MSME. So first thing that MSMEs are getting is restructuring, right? 
Now, now second thing that the MSMEs are getting is this MSME, I told you has to pay an EMI of 1 lakh rupees every month. So the government of India has said that for six months, you don't need to pay any EMI. So six months grace period is being given. This grace period is called as moratorium. So these MSMEs are getting a moratorium period of six months. They don't have to return EMI and they also don't have to pay any rate of interest. So, so this is also happening. So the government of India gave an option to MSMEs that if you want, you can take this grace period. You know how many MSMEs took this grace period? Around 80% of India's MSME took and accepted this opportunity and they did not pay any EMI or rate of interest because they were not in a condition to do it, right? It shows the condition. So almost 80% MSMEs were affected by COVID and they did not pay EMIs for six months. So after giving these two kind of opportunities to MSMEs, the government of India said that if you are an MSME which has been impacted by COVID and to function, you need basic capital, basic money. For example, an MSME is manufacturing water bottle. They are not able to do it. So government of India said, don't worry, you can take new loan from the banks also at reduced rate of interest. So this scheme is called as credit guarantee scheme whereby the government of India is giving guaranteed loan to MSMEs at low rate of interest, subsidized rate of interest, if they are impacted by COVID. So these are the three things that is happening, right? Restructuring, moratorium and credit guarantee scheme for MSMEs. Now guys, there is one, one more thing that the government of India is doing to increase credit in the economy. So see, if if you go in urban areas, you will see something very interesting. You will see people selling, you know, uh, uh, people selling ice cream. They are called as ice cream vendors. You will always see people selling, you know, small water bottles. You will see people selling small toys on the street. So if you go on the street, if you go on the street of urban areas, you will see street vendors. They sell very small products for their livelihood. During COVID, there was lockdown. So what happened to those vendors, street vendors in urban areas, they lost their livelihood. So the government of India has launched a scheme called as PM Swanidhi scheme. Under this scheme, a street vendor can take money from government of India so that they can restart their small, uh, you know, street vending activities. Fine. Now, <clears throat> there are women self-help groups. So guys, suppose there is a group of women they need cash because they want to create a self-help group, right? So they have a self-help group, which means these women perform some basic economic activities and when they make profit, they share the profit amongst themselves. Self-help group, which is led by women only. Now, these self-help groups used to function in such a way that whenever they required fund, they used to contribute their own fund and they used to undertake small economic activities. Many a times, they used to take a loan from the banks also. But because of COVID, they were not in a condition to give any collateral and take loan from a bank. What is a collateral? So if you take something from a bank, let's say 10 lakh rupees, you have to give property papers to the bank. That's collateral. So these self-help groups were not in a condition to give any collateral to the bank because of COVID. So they were not getting bank loans. So the government of India said that if you are a women-led self-help group, you can take loan from the bank up to 20 lakh rupees without giving any collateral. You don't need to give property paper, etc. If you are a group of women indulging in some basic economic activity, you can take up to 20 lakh rupees without giving any collateral to the bank. So these are the two things. Third, there is one more you know, scheme by government of India by RBI called as term liquidity facility. Now, what is term liquidity facility? Very interesting scheme. See, this is your Reserve Bank of India. Now, Reserve Bank of India said that there are many vaccine makers in India. There are many medical equipment manufacturers in India. Those medical equipment manufacturers who manufacture oximeter, thermometer, right? So, there are many manufacturers who manufacture vaccine. There are manufacturers who manufacture medical equipments. And there are people who got affected by COVID. They needed money to pay their hospital bills. So, patients. So, Reserve Bank of India said, that if you are a vaccine ma maker, you are a medical equipment manufacturer or you are patients, then RBI said that you can easily go to a commercial bank and take loans, right? I'll give you an example. So Reserve Bank of India said 
that if there are commercial banks like SBI, HDFC Bank, Reserve Bank of India is ready to give up to 50,000 crore rupees to all the commercial banks taken together like SBI, RBI, ICCI, Axis Bank, all the banks together might take 50,000 crore from RBI. So guys, when you take money from RBI as a loan, you have to pay rate of interest. So if you are HDFC, ICI, etc, etc, you have to pay a rate of interest of 4% called repo rate, right? So you can take up to 50,000 crore rupees by paying 4% rate of interest to RBI. Then if you are HDFC bank or you are SBI, you can use this money 50,000 crore to give as loan to whom? Vaccine maker, medical equipment maker and patients. You can give loan to these three and then you can collect back the loan, right? So RBI would give you money at 4% rate of interest. Then RBI said that whatever money you give, so commercial banks like HDFC, SBI, whatever money they give as loan to vaccine maker, medical equipment manufacturers and patients, whatever loan they give, it will be called as priority sector lending, PSL, priority sector lending. What is priority sector lending guys? So in India, there is a rule. If you are a commercial bank and you are giving loan in the economy, a part of your loan must go to those section of the society which normally don't get loan easily like agriculture like msmes right renewable energy startups so this loan which must go to those section of the society which don't easily get loan is called priority sector lending and rbi says you have to mandatorily give priority sector lending loans so if you are a commercial bank and you are taking money under the scheme called as term liquidity facility and you are giving loan to vaccine maker, medical equipment maker and patients, this loan that you are giving will automatically become a part of priority sector lending. So it becomes, it makes life easy for the commercial banks. Now let's look at the next part which is monetary policy of RBI. So see guys, I told you that when you have to give safety net to people, what do you take care? You take care that people have some money in hand. People should get jobs, right? People should get house. People should get skill. People should get, uh, you know, medicine, uh, health infrastructure, all these things. So RBI also played a very, very important role in, in giving safety net to people in the society. How? So, so I'll give you an example. So let's look at RBI. RBI has a lot of cash and money. When RBI gives money to commercial banks, they charge 4% rate of interest. So suppose guys, this is HDFC bank. HDFC bank is taking some loan from Reserve Bank of India, loan of let's say 1 crore rupees. So HDFC has to give 4% rate of interest to RBI. This 4% is called as repo rate. What is repo rate? Repo rate is the rate at which RBI gives money to commercial banks. RBI over the period of last 2-3 years has kept repo rate to be at normal level of 4%. RBI has not increased this rate. So if a commercial bank like HDFC is taking money from RBI at 4%, this HDFC bank will give this money as loan to people. So guys, suppose you go to HDFC bank and take loan uh, because you have to buy a car. Right? During COVID, you don't want to travel through, through buses, you want to buy a car. So you will take loan from a bank, right? So you will take 5 lakh rupees loan from a bank and bank will charge you 6% rate of interest. Now this bank, SDFC is charging you 6% rate of interest because they also paid 4% rate of interest to RBI. So RBI has kept repo rate to be at 4%. If RBI would have increased this repo rate at 5%, suppose, which means if HDFC bank is getting fund from RBI at 5%, your car loan will increase to 7%. Because if HDFC is getting money at 5%, HDFC will give you money at 7%. RBI did not want it. So what did RBI do? RBI did not increase the repo rate. RBI has kept the repo rate to be 4% only. So that people can get easy loans also. Similarly, when 
banks put their money commercial banks put their money with rbi it is called reverse repo so suppose hdfc bank puts 1 crore rupees with rbi right on this 1 crore rbi will pay a rate of interest of 3.35% this is called reverse repo when you put money with rbi rbi gives you rate of interest RBI hasn't changed this, RBI has kept it to be 3.35 only. So, repo rate has been kept intact, reverse repo has also been kept intact. Now guys, suppose something interesting happens. So, you went for car loan. Similarly guys, suppose that your friend also goes for car loan. Your other friend, so, so there are so many people who go to HDFC bank to take car loan. Now, HDFC bank has a fixed capacity to give loan. But the number of customers all of a sudden starts to increase. So what does SDFC do? SDFC sees that, oh, I don't have money to give to so many people. So what will SDFC do? SDFC will go to RBI. And SDFC will tell RBI that, hey, Mr. RBI, I see so many people have come to take car loans, but I don't have money. Can you give me money for one night? Can you give me loan for one night? RBI says, yes, but why don't you have money? So, SDFC says, because I have given so much loan in the past that now I don't have money. So, RBI says, oh, that means you have been indisciplined. Why didn't you keep some cash in your pocket so that if somebody comes for loan, you could give loan to them? This is indiscipline. So, now RBI scolds SDFC and says, okay, SDFC, you are indisciplined, so we will punish you. Now, we will help you for, for one night, we will give you loan. So, RBI would give RBI would give loan to HDFC for one night, overnight, emergency loan. But the rate of interest charged by RBI will not be repo rate. The rate of interest charged by RBI will be punishment rate. And punishment rate is always higher than repo rate, right? That punishment rate is called marginal standing facility or bank rate, which is 4.25%. So RBI has kept even the punishment rate called as you know, marginal standing facility or bank rate at low level, RBI has not increased it because of COVID. So what is marginal standing facility? If a bank requires urgent money overnight, so they can take this as loan from RBI at a punishment or penal rate of interest called as marginal standing facility or bank rate, which is 4.25%. So RBI hasn't changed it. RBI has kept all these things as low. And by the way, this repo rate in Indian economy is called as policy rate, right? So whatever is the repo rate, other rate of interests in the economy, they align themselves with repo rate. So RBI has kept the repo rate under control, policy rate under control. Now let us look at one of the very, very important uh, questions that can be asked from chapter number one of economic survey and especially in, in mains uh, UPSC GS paper three. So, so, this question, let us read the question guys. It says, India adopted a unique supply side strategy to combat COVID related economic slowdown discuss. So, they are saying that India adopted a very unique supply side formula or supply side model to handle COVID related slowdown discuss. Now, <clears throat> since, since a word unique has been added in the question, it means that there must be something very interesting about India's model which India used to come out of COVID which is not very common, right? Something very unique is there. So, so how to answer this question? To help you understand what the question is, let me take you back to something which I have already discussed in the lecture with you today. So this is called as economic slowdown and its revival policy. See, Whenever economy suffers from a slowdown, uh, let's take for example slowdown related to COVID because we are talk talking about COVID today specifically. So let's say Indian economy is suffering from COVID related, related slowdown. In this slowdown, what do you observe? People have lost job, they don't have cash, they don't have jobs. Expenditure requirement of people is very high because, uh, you know, this is COVID scenario. We need to pay hospital bill. We need to buy food, but we don't have income and we don't have cash. On the other hand, the factories are shut down. The production is very low or zero. The factories are suffering from loss. Suppose you are the policymaker of India and during COVID, you start to reduce taxes, income taxes for people and you start to give them more subsidy to everybody, not only to vulnerable section, but to everybody.
So guys, if you start to give a lot of cash to people, if you reduce the taxes, if you give subsidy, immediately people will, would have a lot of money in their hand, which means they will start to demand more things in the economy. Aggregate demand would increase. When people start to demand a lot of things because there is more liquidity in the economy, because cash is there, people demand a lot of things. When people demand a lot of things, are they going to get the supplies? No. Why? Because factories are shut down. So supply is very less. So aggregate demand would be greater than aggregate supply. This would lead to inflation. Inflation is a scenario which nobody wants in the economy because it disturbs the economy. So when you are facing economic slowdown related to COVID, if you are a policymaker, you don't start with demand side you know, policies, you start with supply side policies. What is supply side policy? You try to help your, your MSMEs, you try to help your manufacturers so that they can produce more, they can supply more, and when they will supply more, then you should increase the demand in the economy by reducing taxes by giving subsidy so that when people demand something factories should supply it and there will be no inflation right how do you make sure during a covid scenario that you help your industries to manufacture more to produce more a very simple thing is give them cash but only giving them cash would not help because even if you give me cash but you don't give me sufficient technology, etc. How will I manufacture good product? So everybody understand that cash is required. But other than cash, what do you need to do to help your industries manufacture more? Right? So, so some of the things that you could give your industries is, see guys, so, so if the economy is suffering from crisis and you don't want inflation in the economy, you should start with supply side measures or reforms and what should you do in supply side there are two things that you can actually do one you should give more technology which means innovation and you should give flexible policies to the industry so guys suppose i manufacture this water bottle or i'm manufacturing vaccine i'm manufacturing medicines medical equipments you know what are the things that i require if if i have to produce more for the society and for the economy i need two things number one I need better technology and government should help me in getting technology. Number two, I need flexibility on the part of the government in policies, which means government should not be rigid in policy making. This is something which I urgently need. And number two, I also need resilience from the side of the government. I need government to create policies which will make Indian economy more resilient and more strong. For example, I need the government to give me basic infrastructure. If government does not give me electricity, water, if government does not give me basic infrastructure facilities, then as an industrialist, I won't be able to produce. So I need two set of policies. One, which improve resilience for the economy. It's a supply side policy. How do you improve resilience? By giving basic infrastructure. And second, if you want to take supply side measures in the economy, then government should promote innovation and be little flexible. What do you mean by promoting innovation and being flexible? Government should do two things to, to, to become more innovative and to become more flexible. Number one, the government should adopt ease of doing business kind of reforms. For example, the government of India should not force the industries to, to sign 20 different documents, 40 different documents to produce something, right? If I have to produce this water bottle, government of India should not force me to sign 40 different documents in 40 different departments. It's, it creates delays and it increases the cost of production. So the government of India must make the process of operation of industries to be smooth and easy, right? And number two, the government of, of India should reduce control over the economy wherever government control is not required. If the government control is not required in a particular field, in, in industrial sector, etc., etc., the government should reduce the control. If control is required, government should control it. For example, in case of defense, it's a strategic sector. So government rules and regulations must be very strict. Government should control that sector. But if you talk about other sectors like renewable energy, etc., you don't need very strict government controls there. Government should promote more of renewable energy by making the entry of you know, industries easy in renewable energy, right? So wherever government controls are required, government should control it. Wherever less controls are required, government should reduce the control. 
So easy processes, ease of doing business and less control. These are the two things that the government should do to promote innovation and flexibility and second to improve resilience of the economy, the government should create basic infrastructure. So see, I have given you India's supply side response to COVID. So guys, what is the question asking? That question that I gave you, this question, it says, India adopted a unique supply side strategy to combat COVID. How? So see, I told you that in economic slowdown related to COVID, you can adopt demand side uh, formula or you can adopt supply side formula, supply side policies. So India adopted supply side, side policies first in supply side we adopted a barbell strategy approach by the way right what are the things that we did in barbell strategy in barbell strategy one set of policies that we adopted was promote innovation and flexibility and second was promote resilience this is our barbell approach right so india adopted a supply side response called as barbell strategy there are i told you in barbell strategy there are two set of policies always in a barbell there are always two set of policies one to improve flexi flexibility and innovation and second to improve resilience of the economy how do you improve resilience of the economy see climate change environmental friendly which means don't create pollution don't increase temperature of earth then social infrastructure like housing toilet water and general infrastructure creation must be done it provides resilience to the economy right it takes care of the vulnerable section then you have reforms which improve flexibility and innovation. I told you how to improve flexibility and innovation through two policies. One, the government should reduce its control wherever it is not required and the government should also promote ease of doing business. For example, how does government of India reduce its control where it is not required? I'll give you an example. You see, drone technology is a very interesting technology and there are so many uses of drone technology. Recently, the government of India has said that they are going to provide drone services to farmers so that they can, you know, use pesticides, insecticides using drone, right? So, so the drone policy was created by government of India last year and that drone policy was, was very, very rigid actually. In that drone policy, it was written that if somebody wants to get in the field of drone technology, you have to you know, get 24 licenses, 24 documents you have to sign. Government of India has reduced it now. From 24 licenses, you need four now for drone. This is called as deregulation. So government has not made it zero license. Four licenses are required, which are basic licenses, but not 24. Similarly, guys, in case of drone technology, the government of India had said that if you make any mistake in drone technology, right, so your punishment will be 5 lakh rupees fine. That's too high, right, for a new technology. So the government has reduced the penalty. If you make any mistake in drone technology, your, your penalty would not be 5 lakh rupees, it would be 1 lakh rupees now. Fine, so these are some of the things. Similarly, government is taking a lot of uh, you know, steps in space sector also. Earlier, for example, you could not use satellite to, to create maps of the entire India and you were not allowed to export those maps, sell those maps. But now the government is becoming lenient. You can use satellites to create maps in India. You can sell those maps and export those maps also. There are restrictions. You cannot do mapping of sensitive areas, border areas, but rest of India, you can do the mapping. So there are many things which are falling under deregulation. Now, what are process reforms, guys? Government procurement, telecom, etc., etc. So you know what used to happen is there are many telecom companies in India which are going bankrupt. They are saying that we cannot operate in a country like India because rules and regulations are very complex. So the government of India is making the rules and regulations very simple, right? This is happening under process reforms. And I told you, under resilience, the government of India is taking steps to provide basic infrastructure and basic facilities. So, so can we discuss some of the important supply side measures, right? So I told you that I'll be giving you some examples of supply side measures. So let's start with this basic supply side measure that the government of India took. You see, in the field of industries, in the budget 2021-22, which means last year budget, the government of India had promised that they will launch a scheme called as Production Linked Incentive Scheme and they allocated a fund of 1.97 lakh crore for that. Now, what is the aim of Production Linked Incentive Scheme? The government of India said that through this scheme, our industrial output will increase, 
employment will increase in the country india will become a exporting country and our import will come down how i'll give you an example so you know government of india since very long always want to wanted to be a global leader in the field of electronic goods india always that had ambition but we could not become a global uh, you know uh, manufacturer of electronics so the government of india said that let us start a scheme called as production linked incentive and let us try to motivate our industries to produce better quality products and to export it to other countries also how so suppose guys this is a company this company manufactures electronic products right in the year 2021 this company which manufactures electronic products its sales was 100 crore worth 100 crore it sold electronic products its sales was worth 100 crore rupees in the year 2022 its sale is almost 140 crore rupees now what is the extra sale that it has done in the year 2022 almost close to 40 crore rupees now government of india is saying that since you are selling more you are producing more we will give you incentives so the government of india announced that they will give 10% 5% this percentage can vary it could be anything for simplicity i have taken 10% so suppose government of india says that on this 40 crore we will give you 10% incentive what is 10% of 40 crore guys 4 crore so the government of india would give 4 crore rupees as incentive to this industry what will this industry do with 4 crore rupees they will buy better raw material better inputs they will create better output right these are the things they will do so so this is the way in which government of india is trying to motivate these industries and when these industries get incentives like 4 crore rupees they will increase output they will provide employment they will export more india's dependence on other countries will come down for electronics right so so what did government of india do government of india has selected almost 13 sectors and 13 sectors are being covered under the scheme called as production linked incentive scheme if you produce more you get more incentive which are these 13 sectors example textile industry electronics are there food processing industry you know drugs pharmaceuticals all of these are a part of this production linked incentives so this is one of the ways to increase supply in the economy now let's come to retrospective taxation this is a very very important reform undertaken by government of india because i'll tell you what used to happen so suppose government of india used to invite you know investors from other countries like usa uk you know uh, germany france and the government of india used to invite them and tell them that hey please come to my country and start manufacturing so those investors who are there in other countries they used to say no we will not come in your country because if we come to your country there is no guarantee that you will not impose an abrupt tax on us so for example suppose somebody from us comes to india and in india currently there is no tax other than income tax but when somebody from us comes and they start a factory all of sudden government of india will say that along with income tax you also have to pay something called as operation tax so so this us company would complain to government of india that when we were coming to your country you never talked about operation tax what is operation tax so the government of india would say that no no we have started this tax only after you came but you have to pay so these are some of the uncertainties that used to exist in this country so many investors used to run away from india and they were saying we are not interested one of the reasons was retrospective taxation let me explain what is retrospective taxation and what happened in india so guys see let's let's go back in time i'm taking you to the year 2007 in the year 2007 one of the biggest telecom company of india was hutch sr india right so they were one of the biggest in india they had 22% market share which means 1/4 of indian market indian telecom market belonged to hutch sr india 1/4 was their share in the market now they had a customer base of almost 2.5 crores right they had 2.5 crore customers in india and they had a market share of almost 22% 25% they were a dominant player in indian telecom market now 67% shares of hutch sr all right guys 67% shares of hutch sr was with a company called cgp investment 
This CGP Investment is a company which was registered in Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands is a tax haven, by the way. So in, in Cayman Islands, there is a company called CGP Investment. They had bought 67% shares of Hutch. Right? Hutch SR India, 67%. This CGP Investment actually was owned by a company in Hong Kong called as Hutchison Telecom. This Hutchison Telecom actually was the owner or parent company of CGP. So this CGP was owned by Hutch. Fine. Now Vodafone, a, a, a company belonging to Britain, it wanted to enter India in the year 2007. But you know, Indian government has created so many rules and regulations at that time. India had created a lot of obstructions. It was not easy to come to India and operate. So they realized that if we come in a normal manner, it might take us one year to come. So many documents, so many departments. So they said, you know, we want to come to India fast because India is a big market. We can make profit. So what did they do? Instead of directly coming to India, they went to Hutchison Telecom Hong Kong. So Vodafone went there and Vodafone requested them that Vodafone wants to buy CGP. And I told you CGP belonged to Hutchison Telecom. So Hutchison Telecom sold C CGP to Vodafone. So Vodafone bought CGP. And I told you that CGP was holding 67% shares of Hutch, Hutch SR India. So when Vodafone bought CGP, right? So 67% shares of Hutch SR India, it also went to Vodafone. So Vodafone bought CGP, 67% shares also went to Vodafone. And Vodafone paid a price of 55,000 crore rupees to Hutchison Telecom. The moment this deal happened, Vodafone came to India and started to operate. Now, why? Because Vodafone now has 67% shares of Hutch SR India. So it easily entered Indian economy, right? Now the government of India was watching this and the government said, Mr. Vodafone, you have 67% shares of Hutch, you just bought it. So you have to pay a tax of 11,000 crore rupees to government of India. Now Vodafone told government of India, why should I pay a tax? Because according to the current rules, according to the rules of income tax 2007 in government of India, according to the rules, if any deal like this was happening outside India, so Vodafone is an outsider company, foreign company. They bought CGP, which is a foreign company. And they bought CGP from Hutchison Telecom, which is a foreign company. So everything is happening outside India, not within India. And all of these players who are involved, they are not Indian companies, right? This is a Hong Kong company. This is a Cayman company, Cayman Island. And this is a British company. So since all these were not residents of India, they were not supposed to pay income taxes. All right. So, so the government of India told them to pay taxes. They said, no, we will not pay you tax. So, so the government of India said that you have to pay a tax and the government sent a notice to Vodafone. So Vodafone went, went to Bombay High Court. In Bombay High Court, the Vodafone lost the case and Bombay High Court said to Vodafone that you have to pay a tax of 11,000 crore rupees. Vodafone then went to Supreme Court. Supreme Court gave the ruling in favor of Vodafone and said that Vodafone, Hutchison and CGP, all these companies are not resident of India. So since this deal happened outside India, Vodafone is not supposed to pay any taxes to government of India. Fine. Now government of India did not like it. So what did government of India do? In the year 2012, look at this. In the year 2012, the government of India made some changes in the income tax rule of India, in the tax rules of India, and the government of India introduced something called as retrospective taxation. What is the meaning of retrospective taxation? In the year 2012, when Supreme Court gave a ruling in favor of Vodafone, the government of India created a rule and government of India said that now government has the powers, because government created a rule, government has the powers to go back in time, 2007, and impose any kind of tax on any kind of deal that has happened. So the government of India in the year 2012 went back in time to 2007 and imposed a tax on Vodafone and said, now you give us money. 
Vodafone found this to be very bad. And in fact, not only Vodafone, but government of India has used this retrospective taxation on 18 companies so far. And from these 18 companies, through retrospective taxation, government of India has received almost close to 80,000 crore rupees as tax. But this year, as I told you that it's written in the economic survey that government of India has done away with retrospective taxation. And government of India is actually returning this money to these companies, including Vodafone. And the government is saying that it does not want to continue with retrospective taxation, which means now foreigners are not scared of India that if we go to India, government will create a new tax and they will impose taxes in the past also. So foreign companies are feeling much safer in India. This is a reform which government of India has undertaken. This is a process reform, guys, because it is making the process easy. Fine. So retrospective taxation has been done away with. Now let's see what about MSME sector. Has government of India undertaken any reform for MSME sector? Yes. So, so the first thing that the government of India has done for MSME sector is government of India has revised the definition of MSME. So now there is no distinction between manufacturing and service related MSME. Now the government is saying both manufacturing and service related MSMEs will be covered under same definition. What is the new definition of micro, small and medium enterprises? So see, if this is your company, which is MSME, right, micro, small and medium enterprise. How do you call an industry or enterprise as micro, as small or medium based on what? So if the investment in plant, machine and equipment. So guys, suppose this is my factory. So this is called as a plant. In this factory, there will be machines, there will be equipments, right? And there will be a value of the plant, equipment and machine. So if the investment in plant, machinery and equipment, which means plant, machinery and equipment, if the investment is less than one crore, and if the annual turnover, annual turnover means, so, so for example, guys, suppose this factory manufactures water bottles like this and they sell water bottles worth 100 crore. 100 crore is the annual turnover. Whatever is the sale value is your annual turnover. So if the investment in plant and machinery is less than 1 crore and annual turnover is less than 5 crore, such enterprises are called as micro enterprises. If the investment is between 1 to 10 crore in plant and machinery and if your annual turnover is between 5 to 50 crore, you are called as a small enterprise. If your investment in plant and machinery is between 10 to 50 crore and if your annual turnover is between 50 to 250 crore, you are called as a medium enterprise. So micro, small and medium enterprise. This is the new definition which I have taken from economic survey. You must remember it for prelims, mains and interview. Now let me tell you what has government of India done in the field of telecom. So there is a reform which government of India has introduced in the field of telecom, which is like a life savior for the telecom companies. Let me explain it to you. So you know, suppose that somebody is there in USA and, and that, that company wants to invest in India. They want to start a new telecom company in India. So of course, they are going to bring their own technology, their own money. Is it allowed in India? Yes. Now, if a foreigner wants to bring investment in India, 100% foreign direct investment is allowed in telecom under automatic route, which means if somebody wants to invest in telecom sector in India, they can bring 100% investment. They don't have to take prior permission from government of India. Automatic route means they don't have to take prior permission. They just need to come to India and invest. Number two, whenever telecom companies in India were importing wireless instruments in India, they had to undergo a lot of verification checks by custom department. This used to create delay, this used to create problem. Now when the telecom companies are bringing or importing wireless instruments in India, they don't have to go through custom clearance checkup, etc, etc. They just need to sign a form where they will self-declare that we have bought these wireless instruments from this country. That's it. So a self-declaration form where you have to declare that you have bought something, imported something, which is a wireless instrument that is good enough. You don't need to go through custom clearance now. So removal of custom clearance for import of wireless equipments has happened. These two reforms, right? And there is a third reform. It's a very interesting reform. So this one is, is going to be very interesting. You must remember it for UPSC. 
So guys, I have taken the example of Vodafone idea because it was there in the news. So, so suppose Vodafone idea, they are operating in India. So there are two types of income that they are getting in India. All right. So, so one income is related to their telecom services called as core income. So if you if you are using Vodafone SIM card, are you are you paying money to the Vodafone for your data use for using the SIM card? Yes. So the money that Vodafone idea is earning through its SIM card, its internet service, it's called a telecom income, it's core income, right? Suppose the core income is 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 90 crore rupees for Vodafone, right? Now there is other income which Vodafone idea are also earning. For example, suppose they have given something on rent, right? Not telecom income, but rented property, etc. etc. So, so that is called as non-core income because their job is not to give properties on rent, their main job is telecom. So suppose they are earning 10 crore rupees through that. So their total income becomes 90 plus 10, 100 crore rupees. And in India, it has been typically seen that whatever is the earning of these telecom companies, 90% of their earning is core income, telecom income, 10% is mostly non-core. It has been observed in India. Now, government of India is very smart. Government of India has given a name to this 100 crore rupees. Government of India calls it as adjusted gross revenue, AGR, right? Now, government of India puts a lot of taxes, a lot of cess, a lot of surcharge on this income of the telecom companies. So, for example, see, government imposed taxes and cess on AGR. These telecom companies have been complaining to government of India that, Mr. Government of India, you put a tax called as telecom tax, cess, etc. on this income, but this income also has a component of other income which is not telecom income. So why do you put a tax on this total income? You should put a tax on this. The government did not accept this demand of, of the industry for very long. But now the government of India has started to change. Now the government is saying, okay, we will not have this concept called adjusted gross revenue. We are not going to put a tax on this. The government says that now they are going to put a tax only on the telecom income. And there is a special name for it. It is called as APGR which means applicable gross revenue, not adjusted gross revenue, but applicable gross revenue. So now the government of India is going to put a tax only on core income and the core income of telecom companies is called as applicable gross revenue. Fine, this is one of the reforms. So guys, so far in this topic, state of the economy, we have covered the theme, we have covered the economic revival. Now we are going to get into report card of the economy and then we would go and look into the growth outlook of the Indian economy. So what is the report card of the Indian economy? How does it look like? So we are going to examine first something related to vaccination. Then we would look at the sectoral trend, basic sectoral trend because anyways we have to look into the details of the sectors when we do uh, you know sectors like agriculture, industry and services in different chapters. But here we will have a look at the overall trend in different sectors. Then we are going to look into the macroeconomic uh, aspects of the Indian economy. Then we would have a look into the demand trend, the supply trend. And then as I told you that we would make a comparison between global financial crisis, taper tantrum and COVID related crisis. All right. So guys, now let us have an overview of India's vaccination. All right. This I don't think will, will be asked in, in prelims or mains. Just, just for, for basic idea, let us have a look into what vaccination looks like in India. So far in India, we have these phases of vaccination. For example, phase one, it started from January 16th, 2021. Right. And by the way, January 16th is also called as startup day in India. So January 16, 2021, uh, you know, phase one of vaccination started. And what was the target group? Health and frontline workers, those who are giving us health services and who are tackling COVID at various levels, they were vaccinated first. In phase two, which started from March 1st, 2021, anyone above 45 years of age got vaccinated. Phase three, May 1st, 2021, people between 18 to 44 years, they got vaccinated. Phase four, January 3rd, 2022, so between 15 and 18 years, uh, you know, got vaccinated and Omicron booster dose, which started from January 10th, 2022. 
so it is meant for healthcare and frontline workers plus senior citizens above 60 years with comorbidities which means if you are a senior citizen with 60 years and you are suffering from other ailments and other diseases like let's say let's say diabetes or heart related problems cardio issues etc so that is called comorbidity and in that case you can get vaccinated with a booster dose because you are vulnerable to omicron right so this is your small report card on vaccination now, almost 93% of Indian population has been vaccinated with the first dose and close to 70%, which means 69.8, 70% has been vaccinated with the second dose, right? So this is how the vaccine data looks like. 93% first, 70% dose second. Now let us have a look at the sectoral trend of Indian economy. We are going to look into agriculture, industry and services. So, so I wanted to give you a very basic idea of different sectors. So see agriculture and allied sector. So their share in the national income currently. So if India's national income is let's say 100 rupees, what is the share of agriculture and allied sector? Close to 18.8 rupees, which means 19 rupees, right? If India earns 100 rupees, 18.8 rupees is contributed by agriculture. What is the contribution of industry in our national income? 28.2%. What is the contribution of services? 53%. Half of our national income comes from services, right? Now, let us have uh, an overview of how different sectors are performing in India. Basic idea. But before we do that, I want to show you this. Look at this graph, guys. So, so this is your zero line. This line is your x-axis, right? This is your x-axis. This is your y-axis, right? That's zero line. If you come down, it's negative. If you go up, it's positive, right? So it's positive and it's negative. Like here you have plus one. Here you will have minus one. Now, if something is coming from positive going to negative, right, then again going up, then again going down, it is called a swing. It's swinging, it's going up and down, right, positive, negative, positive, negative, swinging. There is a lot of variation, right. What is muted? So, for example, something starts from here, positive. It comes down, then goes up, comes down. So that's muted. Why? Because from positive, it is not coming very deep down, not going very deep up. If something from positive comes very deep in negative zone, then goes up, that's a swing. Swing means lot of movement. Muted means movement is there, but it's a controlled movement. Fine. We are going to use it in the analysis of different sectors. See, what is the performance of agriculture and allied sector? So in the year 2019, what was the growth rate of agriculture and allied sector? 4.3%, 2020, 3.6, 2021, it came out to be 3.9. Now, it's very, very important. Why, guys? Because agriculture has shown steady performance. In fact, it is the only sector which showed a positive performance, a balanced performance throughout COVID period, right? So, in fact, its, its rate of growth has increased 3.9%. So, we are saying steady performance. So, steady performance is the trend. You must remember this trend for UPSC. I have recreated this table from the economic survey for you. I have removed the things which are not required. I have inserted this column for you because this is the column which will be asked in UPSC. So what about industries guys? Overall, look at industry. Minus 1.2, minus 7, 11. So swing because from minus 1, it came deep down minus 7 and then 11.8. It's a swing, right? If you look at some of the subsectors of industry. So industry is divided into one, two, three, four, four different subsectors in India. Mining and querying, manufacturing and construction. These three are showing same swing that overall industry is showing. Whereas electricity, gas, water supply, it is not so showing a lot of swing. It is muted. Electricity, gas and water supply, they are basic necessities of life. They can't go negative. So they are positive only, hence they are muted, they don't show swing. But these three are showing a lot of swing, always remember this. Now if you look at services, see 7.2 in the year 2019, 2020 minus 8.4 and then 8.2. So, so, so what do you see? You see positive, then deep negative, then positive, right, services. 
Now, some of the service sector has bounced back, whereas other services in India are still yet to recover. So, if you look at trade, hotel, transport, these things are contact based services, which means you have to come face to face to the service provider to get this service. For example, I go on a Rajasthan trip. So, I need to meet a tour guide. I need to stay in a hotel. This is contact based, contact -based services. So, so from 6.4, they became minus 18.2 and now they have increased to 11.9. So, full recovery hasn't happened. Recovery has happened, but there is more scope of recovery. If you, if you look at services like finance, real estate and professional services, from 7.3, they went down to minus 1.5. Now they have gone 4%. So almost very good recovery has happened in finance because they are not contacts-based services. I can call a chartered accountant over phone and I can get the services, right? So these are not contact-based services. They are long-distance services, distance-based services like public administration, defense and other services, they have also recovered, right? Overall, our gross value added, which means income, national income, 4.1% minus 6.2 and 8.6, right? If you use gross value added at basic price as the measure of India's income, so this is the performance. We have bounced back. Let us look into agriculture, guys. So see, what is there in agriculture? 18, 2.6%. 1920, 4.3%, 2020, 3.6%, 20, 2021, 20, 20, which means last year, 3.9%. Look at the performance of agriculture. Very, very good performance. What has been the food gain production, guys? So, food grain production has also shown a steady increase. This question can be asked in UPSC. They might ask you that what is the trend of food grain production in India? So, if they ask you that question, so you have to say that food grain production in India is showing increasing trend. Look at the arrow, increasing trend, isn't it? These kind of questions are asked. What is the performance of industry? So, let's see. Industrial growth, look at industries. Uh, you remember I told you something called a swing and muted response. Look at industry, swing. See the swing, right? So, industries are showing swing. So minus 1.2, minus 7 and then 11.8 is the positive growth. So a lot of swing is there. Look at the performance of some of the most important industries of India. For example, cement, steel, electricity. These are some of the most crucial core industries of India. What has been the performance? So during the first lockdown, look at the performance of core industries. It dipped down like this. Means from positive, it became so bad. So, so then they recovered, V-shaped recovery. But again, second wave happened. But this time in the second wave, the reduction in the performance of core industries was less, which means India knew how to handle the second wave. In second wave, we lost a lot of lives, but industries showed a lot of resilience, right? So first lockdown was a lesson. Second lockdown, we, we at least knew how COVID looks like. So we planned accordingly. So look, our performance in the industries was bad, but it was not as bad as the first wave. Fine. This question might be asked in prelims. That reduction in the performance of core industries was more in the first lockdown or second lockdown. So first lockdown. Revival of construction sector, very important. Why? Because construction sector provides a lot of employment to migrant workers in India. A lot of people depend on construction sector for their livelihood. So do we know construction sector's performance? Yes. Construction sector uses a lot of cement, a lot of steel. So if the consumption of cement and steel goes up in the economy, it simply means that construction sector is trying to recover. So, so look at the you know, performance of cement. Cement is this line. It's, it's going up, right? It's improving. Look at the performance of steel. It's going up, which means if the, if the consumption of steel and cement is going up, your construction sector is recovering. So that this fact we must keep in mind. Services, I have already told you that half of India's national income comes from services. There are two types of services, contact-based service. This has not recovered fully. Distance-enabled services like... Uh, financial services, educational services, here we have recovered to a great extent. Now guys, we are going to, to look at the macro stability indicators of India. Very, very important, right? We are going to look at the macro aspects of the economy. Let's first look at inflation. See guys, about inflation, 
there are two things that we are going to look into. What is the inflation in the developed countries and what is the inflation in the developing countries? So, so if you look carefully, the inflation in developed countries, see, if this is your, this is your inflation and this is your year. So this is the inflation in developing countries. Like inflation in developing countries is higher. Inflation in developed countries is like this. Both are showing inflation, but inflation in developed countries is less than inflation in developing. But both are showing inflation. Why does inflation happen? I'll give you an example. Suppose guys that I am manufacturing this water bottle in India. Now to manufacture this water bottle, I need workers, I need capital, I need raw material. Suppose the raw material that I'm using to manufacture this water comes from China. Now China is also under lockdown, so I will not get the raw material. So I will have to buy the raw material from somewhere else. So the cost of production goes up. This will lead to inflation. Similarly, if my workers are going back to their villages, reverse migration. So cost of production of the bottle goes up because the wages increase in the economy. Similarly, when I manufacture this water bottle in India and suppose I am transporting this water bottle to US through water channel like ships, fine. How do you transport something using ship? You put it in containers. Have you seen in, in news channels, big, big iron containers, big metal containers. Inside that we put water bottles, we export it using ship, right. So the cost of you know, construction of, of the cost of manufacturing of those containers has increased. The charges or, or the fee taken by the ships has increased. So everything has become costly. Hence, this water will also become costly. So in the world, you see that these days the world is suffering from inflation because of rising energy prices, which means oil prices are increasing. Electricity is increasing. Of course, everything will become costly. So, so if oil prices increase, Ola will charge you more money, isn't it? So flights will increase their tickets, ticket prices, input prices have increased. There is disruption in global supply chain and there is rising freight cost. What is freight cost? Cost of sending your goods, right? So all these things are increasing, hence there is inflation in the world, right? Now, how do you measure inflation, guys? So, so in India, for example, how do you measure inflation? Look at this. This is a mandi, wholesale mandi, right? Wholesale mandi is a place where you buy things in bulk. For example, if I have to buy 5000 water bottles like this, I will go to wholesale mandi. Fine. And if you want to see whether prices have increased in the wholesale mandi or not, you should check it using an inflation called as wholesale price index. How do you measure whether the prices have increased in the wholesale mandi? You use uh, uh, an index called as wholesale price index. It measures the increase in price in the wholesale mandi. Similarly, if you want to buy one or two water bottles, if you want to buy cookies, coffee, etc., where do you go? You go to these big, big, you know, supermarkets like Big Bazaar, etc., etc. So when you when you go to these supermarkets like Big Bazaars and all, you are a retail consumer. You are buying things for your own use, right? So if I want to see whether prices are affecting you, the retail consumer, which inflation shall I use? I should use consumer price index because consumer price index shows the inflation faced by consumer in day to day things. Wholesale price index shows the inflation showed in the wholesale market, right? So in both these markets, it was observed that there was inflation in India. But the consumer price inflation was controlled by the government of India and the wholesale price index or inflation could not be controlled. Why? In the wholesale market, we also see that there is, you know, trading or buying and selling of food, there is buying and selling of petrol, there is buying and selling of energy related things like other metals, etc, etc, right? In wholesale market, you will get so many things in bulk. You want to buy copper, aluminium, steel, petroleum, everything is available in the wholesale market. Most of the things, the metal that I am talking about, copper, aluminium, etc. and the oil related products, all these things, most of the, these things India imports from outside. 
we import a lot of things from outside including some metals including oil hence the wholesale price index is very very high we call it imported inflation because suppose you are buying this this bottle full of oil petroleum from other countries middle east countries opec countries its price goes up so in the wholesale market in india the prices will go up so our wholesale price index goes up it is called imported inflation because prices have not increased because of india it has increased because it, the oil is costly in the global market in the consumer price index in the consumer market initially the food prices increased but government of india was able to control it right hence consumer price index even though it was increasing it could be controlled fine so let's see this is the inflation trend see guys so 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 look at this this is your consumer price index it it increased to 6.2% but later on it was controlled but your wholesale price index could not be controlled because of oil prices etc hence there is a huge gap between wholesale price index and consumer price index consumer price was controlled wholesale price could not be controlled so now guys let us look into external sectors right what is external sector you know that any economy for that matter in this globalized world any economy indulges in two kinds of activities when it comes to international trade for example suppose government of india manufactures this water bottle so in india we are manufacturing water bottle so we will export it when we export it we earn dollars we earn income right similarly you know india buys a lot of oil gold etc so we import those things so when we import something we pay money ideally if you want to remain a healthy economy you should export more you should import less during covid what happened there was a global lockdown so import reduced in india we were importing less import reduced very fast but on the other hand the government of india created some policies like production linked incentive scheme our agriculture was doing well so actually something very interesting happened india was able to increase its export and reduce its import right during covid so in two years during the covid we observed that india's export has increased especially the export of merchandise merchandise means goods and why did the export of india increase because of agriculture and because of schemes like you know production linked incentives make in india our export increased our imports came down because there was a lot of lockdown in other countries so we could not import more when your exports are going up imports are coming down of course you achieve something called balance of payment surplus because export is greater than import for two years we attain balance of payment surplus when you are selling more you will get more foreign exchange reserves right so india has the world's fourth largest foreign exchange reserve see this rank can go up and down we might become third we might become fifth but the thing is that we are in top five in terms of foreign exchange reserves why does a country need foreign exchange reserve guys we use foreign exchange reserve to import something from other countries so you know the foreign exchange reserve that we have 634 billion dollars we can use it to import anything that we want for close to 13.2 months so if india wants to use its foreign exchange reserve just to you know import something we can keep importing for a very long time using our foreign exchange reserves so see how our external sector looks like so our balance of payment is positive it is not coming below, below zero line right it has been positive it has been going down of course but it is positive since last two years and our foreign exchange reserve is also increasing and our import cover import cover means for how long can you import using your foreign exchange reserve it shows the strength of your economy so our import cover also is sufficient it can improve of course but it is good at this phase so now guys let us look into a very important macroeconomic indicator called as fiscal balance very very important concept you see government of india during covid was looking at two things very very carefully the government was looking at its income and the government was looking at its expenditure when you take income and expenditure together it is nothing but budget now it's very important to know whether our income increased or not so in last one year we saw that our revenue has increased revenue means revenue of government of india has increased 
uh, of course, the expenditure of the government has also gone up because during COVID, the government had to spend a lot of money under Atmanirbhar Bharat package and other things, right? But our revenue collection, income of the government was good. Now, how do you know income of the government is good? We look at the data of direct taxes. What is direct tax? Income tax is an example of direct tax. So, its collection increased. What are indirect taxes? Example of indirect taxes is GST, VAT. All these things are indirect taxes. So, their collection also went up. Both the taxes went up. Of course, our expenditure is high and so is our income. Since the income of the government was increasing last year, so something very interesting happened, guys. When your income is increasing, to spend money on people, would you borrow a lot of money from others? If we are talking about government of India, we know that the government's income is increasing. Government has to spend a lot on health, etc. But since our income is increasing, don't you think that the borrowings by government of India will come down? Yes. Why? Because our revenue is going up. When our borrowings are coming down and our revenue is going up, don't you think that government of India has a unique opportunity to use this revenue in, in you know, capital expenditure in the economy, for example, construction of roads, for example, construction of more factories and all these things, construction of assets, airports and all. Yes. When the income of the government is going up, our borrowings are coming down because our income is going up. So, government has a unique opportunity to use its income in creating some nice assets in the economy like roads, hospitals, school, bridges, right, isn't it? Similarly, Government of India also has a unique opportunity to provide safety net to people. Do you remember barbell strategy? I taught you barbell strategy has two things, agile approach and safety net. How will government of India provide you know, uh, basic things like food, clothing and shelter to people? These are called safety nets. Government of India can provide safety net to people only if government has good revenue. And, and, and economic survey says our tax collection, direct taxes, indirect taxes are good, so our borrowings are less. What is borrowing? Fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit is nothing but a form of government borrowing. So our fiscal deficit reduced last year because our revenue went up. And since our revenue went up, we have a unique opportunity to increase our capital expenditure. What is capital expenditure? Expenditure on asset creation in the economy like roads, bridges, schools, hospital, etc. Plus provide safety net to people. We can do these things because we have a good revenue. Let's look at the financial sector. Guys, have a look at this. What do you see? You see, ease my trip. Then you would see Nika, Paytm, Zomato. What did they do? So, so, have you heard about IPO, Initial Public Offering, right, IPO. What happens in IPO? So, so all these companies launched something called as IPO. IPO means Initial Public Offering. So, if a company sells shares to the public for the first time, you know, why do you sell share? If I am the owner of Paytm, why will I sell share to public? Because I have to raise resources. If I sell share, I will get capital. So when a company sells share to the public for the first time, it is called initial public offering or IPO. And what does a company get by selling shares for the first time to people? The company gets capital or money, right? And this capital can be used for the growth of the company. So, India saw huge amount of IPO in last one year. All right, so let me give you the data. It's given in the economic survey that if you look at India, India was able to get almost close to 89,000 crore rupees in the form of IPO. Different companies of India released IPO and through IPO, different companies of India could get close to 89,000 crore rupees. That's a huge amount and we did better than most of the countries of the world who are of similar nature as India, which means if you compare other developing countries of the world, India did much better in terms of IPO. So, so far we have done vaccination, sectoral trend, macro stability. Now guys, we are going to do the demand trend, then we will do supply trend, all right? So, and, and then we will do this comparison between different types of crisis, all right? So now guys, we are going to look into the demand trends in the economy. So, if I may ask, who demands things in the economy? Who demands goods and services in the economy? So, so, so let me give you some options. 
do you demand goods and services in the economy which means a private individual yes so see private consumption when you demand goods and services in the economy for consumption purposes it is called as private consumption so guys whenever you buy something from the market so let's say you are buying a mobile phone a laptop etc you are buying food do you pay money when you buy these things yes so if you buy something in the economy does the national income of india go up yes whenever you buy something the national income of india goes up so you contribute in the gdp or national income of india similarly who else buys goods and services in the economy the government of india government of india also buys goods and services so government consumption right government also pays salary to us right if you become bureaucrat whenever you join services you will get wages and salary that is called as government expenditure so who spends in the economy private people for consumption then government spends in the economy third investment so investors also demand capital so for example suppose i am a businessman i want to i want to construct a factory what will i do i will use my own capital or i will borrow money from a bank and i will invest when i invest i create a factory i manufacture more goods and services and this leads to more capital formation in the economy so businessman they also invest in the economy so investment now when we export something guys our income goes up because we get dollars but when we import we pay money so our income goes down so export has a positive sign import has a negative sign all these things have an effect on the income of india right so income of india is equal to private consumption which means money that you and i spend on buying goods and services government consumption investment export and import so if i convert all these things into symbols then gdp is equal to c c means private consumption g means government consumption expenditure i means investment ex means exports im means import right so this is how the national income or gdp of india looks like now we are going to examine who contributes how much in the national income of india so suppose you are taking the year 2019 in the year 2019 our gdp for example our national income suppose was 100 crore rupees simple and only 100 crore rupees so if our national income in the year 2019 was 100 crore rupees out of that 60 crore rupees was the contribution of private consumption which means when people like you and i spend money in the market our income goes up our contribution was 60% this is this is very very high right so if people like you and i stop buying things in the market our gdp will go down so during covid what happened people bought less items people bought less goods and services so our gdp went down so in the year 2019 the contribution by private individuals in consumption was 60 crore 60% out of 100 crore income of india 60 crore was you know contributed by private individuals in the year 2021 if our national income is 100 crore only same what is the contribution of private individuals private consumption only 57 crores which means recovery has not happened as far as private individuals are concerned earlier people were spending 60 crore in the market now people like you and i are spending only 57 crore hence our gdp is going down let's look at what is the contribution of government of india in our national income the government contributed 11 crore rupees in the year 2019 in our national income now the government is contributing 12.2 crore which means is the government expenditure increasing or decreasing it's increasing so yes government of india has fully recovered its expenditure earlier it was spending 11 crore now it is spending 12.2 crore in the year 2021 which means 100% recovery has happened as far as government consumption is concerned now government is in consuming as much as it was consuming earlier so 100% recovery but here recovery by private individual is not good let's talk about investment earlier the contribution of investment was 28 crore in india's national income so the contribution of investment was 28% what is the contribution of investment last year 2021 29% which means it has happened for the first time in 7 years that our investment level is so much so if somebody asks you what is the contribution of investment in india's national income you should say 29% or 29 crore 29% right this is good so the recovery has happened earlier we were 
you know, investment was 28%, now investment is 29%. So full recovery in investment has happened. Let us look at the recovery in export, guys. Earlier we were exporting 18%. What was the contribution of export in India's national income? 18%. What is the contribution of export in India's national income now? 20%. So export has also recovered. How much were we importing earlier? 21. What was the contribution of, of import in national income? So import pulls down the national income. So earlier our import was having an effect of 21% on national income. Now our import has an effect of 23% on national income, which is not good. Our import needs to be controlled. All right. So, so this is a chart which is very important. So if somebody will ask you that has India recovered in terms of private consumption compared to pre-COVID in the post-COVID world. So 2019 is pre-COVID, 2021 is post-COVID. So in post-COVID world has India recovered in terms of private consumption expenditure? No. Are people spending money? Less money. We are spending less money. So see recovery is not good. Have we recovered in terms of government expenditure? Yes, 100% recovered. See, have we recovered in terms of investment? Definitely. Export? Yes. Import? Yes. All right. So now we are going to look into, so demand side is done. Now we are going to look into the supply side. And what is the problem in supply side? So guys, see, if you look at economic survey, if you, if you look at table number three, it will show you something like this. Table number four will show you something like this. I have changed all these things and given you that presentation. Uh, so, so where, you know, I told you that GDP of India is 100 crore and all those things. So that's the simplified form of this table only. So you don't need to do this table, right? Now, let me tell you what is supply side trend in the economy. So please have a look. You see, look at this, please. I told you that, for example, suppose we manufacture these water bottles in India. When you manufacture these water bottles, if you have to export it to other countries like USA, how will you export it? You will put these water bottles in containers like this. Look at these containers, isn't it? There are so many containers, boxes. These containers are then loaded on the ship and the ship carries these containers to other countries. What has happened because of COVID? Because of COVID, the fare charged by ship has increased because oil prices have increased. So, for example, earlier the price of this water bottle in US was $1 because India was exporting it. Now, because of increasing oil prices, the ship fare has increased. So, price of this water bottle in US now is $2. So, see it's increasing. Also, something has happened that the manufacturing of these containers has reduced because of COVID. So if, if, if suppose I am a factory owner in India and I have to send it to US, I need to put it in the containers, but containers are not available. So the price of container has gone up. So the price of this water bottle in US was $1 because of the ship fare, it became $2 and because of lack of containers, containers have become costly. The price of this water bottle in US market will become $3. So what did you observe? You observed that there are supply related problems because containers are not available. The price of container has gone up, oil prices have increased and the fare of this ship has also increased. Plus, there is one more, more problem. Let me tell you a typical problem being faced by India. Now, let us have a look at one of the peculiar supply side constraint and problem that India is facing. You know, guys, this is called a semiconductor, right? It's a chip. This semiconductor is used in many things. It's, it's used in mobile phones, it's used in laptops, it's used in automobile, right? India is not a manufacturer of this. India has been importing this a lot from other countries. Now, especially, for example, China. So, so every automobile industry uses this. Now in India, after the COVID lockdown has been relaxed, people are demanding a lot of vehicles, lot of four wheelers, two wheelers, etc. But the supply of, of these, uh, you know, these, these semiconductors and chip from other countries has reduced. Hence, if you go and try to book a car today, the waiting period is almost three months, four months and six months. Why? Because this chip is not available. So, so this is a major supply constraint that India is facing. So what did government of India do? Now the government of India has started to promote the manufacturing of semiconductors in India. But there is a problem with the manufacturing of semiconductors. You see, the manufacturing of semiconductor is not a very short term you know, kind of investment. It takes 
months, three months, four months or five months to give results. So, so here if you invest in the semiconductor factory today, you will start to make profits after goods five, six months. If you start to invest in this industry today, you will get your product after two, three months. So the time period is huge after which you will get the product. Plus, you will start to make profit in this industry after five to six months. So gestation period is huge. Hence, even though we have started to, to manufacture semiconductors, the government has you know, started to promote it, but the results will not come immediately, which means this problem will remain for next five to six months. So guys, now let us compare what is the impact of global financial crisis, taper tantrum and COVID related crisis on the macroeconomic indicators of India, which means that essentially we are going to, you know, compare the impact of three different type of crisis on the economy. This is given in the first chapter of economic survey and I found this to be very interesting and maybe, just maybe UPSC might ask you this question in prelims or mains. So to understand what is, what is the comparison and how does the comparison look like, we first need to understand what was there in global financial crisis and what is taper tantrum, only then we are going to be able to compare these three. So let us see what happened during global financial crisis and during taper tantrum. Now, <clears throat> the global financial crisis that the economic survey is talking about, so they have taken a time period of 2008 and 2009 because this is the time when global financial crisis had occurred. So I have also taken it here, 2008 and 2009. This is the beginning of the global financial crisis. When the global financial crisis happened, it did not only affect the US economy, it affected the entire world. It, it led to Eurozone crisis, it affected India, it affected entire world because see guys, this is globalization in which we are living. This is a globalization era. Globalization leads to, you know, leads to transmission of both good and bad things across the world. If something good happens in one part of the world, it travels to all the parts of the world. If something bad happens, it travels very fast. So when global financial crisis happened, it impacted the entire global economy. Now during global financial crisis, many companies were shut down. You know, many banks became bankrupt. The governments lost so much of revenue, people became jobless, they committed suicides, there was sadness and depression all around. During global financial crisis, the central bank of USA called US Fed, they said that we are going to follow expansionary monetary policy. What is expansionary monetary policy? The US Fed said that we are going to pump more dollars and liquidity in the economy. And they followed this policy between the year 2008 and 2012, right? So 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, these are the years in which it followed this policy. What was the policy look like? So, so, so the US Fed, which means the central bank of USA, they started to buy bonds from the market. So for example, suppose guys, that's you, that's me, right? What are we holding? We are holding bonds. So the US Fed would come in the market and they would say, give me your bond, I will pay you money. So the US Fed used to buy these bonds. So see, these bonds are reaching the Fed and in return, the US Fed used to pump dollars in the economy. So if, if I am the US Fed, if I would come to you, I will buy your bond, what will I give you? I will give you dollars. So in the economy, in the market, in US, a lot of dollar was floating all around. When you have too much of money around you, what will be the interest rate? Generally in such an economy, interest rate is little low. It's on the lower side. So the interest rate was low. Now, when these people were selling bonds in the US, the US Fed was giving them dollars. The interest rate in US economy was low. So what do these people do? These people who had cash in the US economy, they started to bring their dollars to developing and emerging countries like India. They started to invest in India called as Foreign Institutional Investment, FII. They brought a lot of money, it's called hot money because this money comes in a country and leaves. Whenever it sees that there is, there is something wrong in the economy or there is a better opportunity, they will leave your country. So dollars from US started to come to India because in India the interest rate was slightly higher than USA. And whenever the interest rate is higher, the investors come in those economies to make profit. So this actually happened. 
Now, around the year 2010-13, and by the way, this program of, of the US government, whereby they were buying bonds and they were releasing dollars, was called as quantitative easing program. This quantitative easing program was conducted in US between the year 2008 and 2012. Now, in the year 2012, around 2012 and 2013 actually, to be precise. So, around 2012 and 2013, the, 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 the chairman of, of Fed, which means the Central Bank of USA, so Mr. Ben Bernanke, you know what he said. He made a statement. So, so he is Ben Bernanke, the, the chairman of Fed. So, he made a statement. He said that it might be possible that the government of USA or the Fed of USA might buy less bonds in future. He did not say that he is actually going to do it. He said we might buy less bonds in future. This would be called as taper tantrum because USA Fed said, Mr. Ben Bernanke said that we are going to taper, which means we are going to reduce the buying of bonds. It might be possible. The moment this news is spread in the US economy and the global economy, everybody assumed that, hey, see, now US Fed is not going to demand bonds. So the demand of bonds actually fell in the market and supply of bond increased, which means now everybody started to say this bond that we are holding is not useful, you know, because Fed will not demand the bond. So there was a lot of bond in the market. People were ready to sell, but there was nobody to buy. And people expected that Fed will not buy the bond, so demand of the bond would come down. When people expected that demand of the bond would come down, and guys, you know the basic principle of economics, that if the demand of something comes down, it price also comes down. So the price of bond actually started to reduce in US. See, real things have not happened. He made a statement that we might not buy bonds in future. So people expected that demand of bond has actually come down because chairman of Fed is saying this. And then the bond prices started to come down. Why? Because if the demand of something goes down, its price goes down. And you know that whenever the price of bond goes down, the bond yield goes up. Because bond yield and bond price, they are inversely related. I'll give you an example. So suppose guys, I want to buy a house. The price of the house normally, the house that I want to buy, suppose its price is 50 lakh rupees. It's very costly. But if I buy that house and I put it on rent, I might get a rent of 20,000 rupees a month. The price of house is 50 lakh. But suppose the price of house goes down, right? For some reason, suppose the price of house goes down to 30 lakh rupees. Somehow I am able to buy the house. How much rent will I get? 20,000 rupees. The rent hasn't changed. Just the price of house has gone down because suppose my friend is selling the house to me. He is in need of money. So he is selling a 50 lakh a house to 30 lakh to me, but the rent is 20,000 a month. So what will I say? That the yield of this house is high. Right? Why? Because if I put less money in the house, 30 lakhs only, I can still get a rent of 20,000 rupees. So when the bond price came down, the you know, just, just like I have given you the example of house that I want to buy. If the bond price comes down, right, the interest on the bond hasn't changed. So the bond yield goes up. So when the bond price comes down, bond yield goes up. The moment bond yield goes up, the interest rate also goes up. Now, now see what has happened in USA. That just because of a statement of, of US Fed, the interest rate in US has increased, bond yield has increased. When the bond yield and interest rate increased in USA, you can imagine what will happen. The money from India, because the dollars in India that you see was sent by US people only. This dollar from India, it started to fly back to USA. Like all the FIIs of India pulled money and they went back. So what is the situation in India now? The situation in India became like this. So this circle, suppose, is the circle of rupee in India and this circle is the circle of dollars. Why is that circle of dollar small? Because the dollars from India went to USA because interest rate in USA was increased. So when the dollars went, this is rupee, this is dollar, all right? So when you have too much of rupee and less of dollars, what is it called as? Appreciation or depreciation, depreciation. Why? Because the value of Indian rupee depreciated. 
so indian rupee actually depreciated when the rupee depreciated and also you observe something interesting you observe that since there is too much of rupee guys what happens there is inflationary tendency also when everybody has a lot of cash in hand they will demand a lot of things isn't it so there is inflationary tendency also so depreciation of rupee happened plus there is inflationary tendency also so what did rbi do at that time to control depreciation and inflation rbi had to increase interest rates in india but you very well know that when you increase interest rate what happens investment goes down but we had to do it right so just because of one policy of us called taper tantrum where they said we will buy less bonds indian economy was impacted also along with other economies of the world indian economy was also impacted and we had to increase the interest rate so our investment went down so global financial crisis followed by taper tantrum and these kind of policies impact indian economy as well now in this chapter in the economic survey the the economic survey is comparing what was the situation of india during global financial crisis what was the situation of india during taper tantrum and what is the situation of india during covid crisis they are comparing all the three situations so see here we have taken some macro economic indicators like inflation external debt what is external debt when india borrows from other countries that is external debt right fdi foreign direct investment forex means foreign exchange reserves that rbi holds and fiscal deficit it is like borrowing by the government so if you look at inflation during global financial crisis it was 9.1% during taper tantrum the inflation in india was 9.4% i told you it was higher during covid it's 5.2% and in covid they have taken 2021 2022 right Ext so so in case of inflation during covid the situation is much better than other two crises which means government was able to control the inflation as far as external debt is concerned look at the external debt if you compare these three it is the lowest during covid so this is also good and why because our direct tax collection indirect tax collection is good that is why it is happening now foreign direct investment 8.3 billion so 34 billion dollars and 48 billion dollars so this is also high and why are so many so many investors coming in india because india is promoting manufacturing etc hence investors are coming plus the rate of interest in other countries today is low in india the rate of interest is slightly higher so foreign direct investment is also coming plus ease of doing business reforms because of that fdi is coming look at the forex reserve during global financial crisis during taper tantrum and now now india is in the top 5 you know of foreign exchange reserves in the world look at fiscal deficit our fiscal deficit during global financial crisis 8.3 taper tantrum 6.9 and today it's high if you compare this with this yes it's high so in few things we are doing well during covid in one of the things we are not doing well which is fiscal deficit so this table i have created from economic survey for you and that taper tantrum concept i gave you so you can you can revise it before your prelims and mains so now guys let us look at the growth outlook and growth prospects of the indian economy according to the analysis given in the economic survey so see if you remember i had given you this particular graph in the last year's economic survey so so i have taken it from there just to to remind you about what happened in last one or two years see if you look at the gdp of india the gdp of india did not come down because of covid crisis the gdp of india started to come down from the year 2017 onwards because there was lack of investment in the economy plus there were structural problems in the economy also so because of these things our gdp had already started to come down in india see the gdp started to come down now when your gdp was already coming down covid happened when covid happened india reached a point when our gdp contracted by see you know gdp reduced by 23.9% so this is how the gdp went down 23.9% reduction or contraction in the gdp and for the first time in the history india entered into technical recession right because quarter after quarter our gdp was coming down so india entered technical recession for the first time because 
of stringent lockdown and COVID, our GDP went down 23.9% reduction. Now, what has happened after that? This is a new graph that I have created, guys. So, see, in the year 2019, our GDP growth rate was 4%. It's here. In 2020, our GDP growth rate was minus 7.3. See, it became less than zero. And then it went up. And finally, in the year 2021, it's 9.2%. This is the V-shape that economic survey is talking about. But we still don't know what will happen in future because maybe a new wave will come and change everything. So there is uncertainty. So far, this is how the recovery shape of India looks like. And we are slightly above this line where we were in 2019. So that is why they are saying that we have already moved above 2019 level. And guys, you already know that in 2019, our rate of growth of GDP was very low. Hence, even if we increase our rate of growth just by little bit, it will look like a good improvement. See, from 2019 level, we are already passing this threshold, right? This is the V-shaped recovery. Now, a question might be asked in UPSC, and this is what I have created for you. So, in the year 2019-20, our GDP growth rate was 4%. Why? Right? A reason. So, reason for this is mainly because our secondary sector, what is secondary sector? Industries, they did not perform well. So, for example, low growth in mining and querying, manufacturing, even basic things like electricity, water supply, hotels, restaurants, all these things did not do well. So, some services did not perform well, plus our manufacturing and industries were also not performing well. So, there was problem all around, lack of investment was there. Hence, in 19, 2019 also, our GDP was 4% only and this is before COVID, right? In the year 2020-2021, because of COVID, our rate of growth of GDP was minus 7.3%. In 2021-22, our rate of growth of GDP is, you know, 9.2%, which means last year it was 9.2%. So, recovery, V-shaped recovery. In the year 2022-23, which means next year, it is projected, according to economic survey, that our rate of growth of GDP will be between 8 to 8.5%. You should memorize this. According to economic survey, it will be 8 to 8.5%. According to World Bank, our GDP rate of growth next year will be 8.7%, which means 2022-23, so this year, 8.7%. According to Asian Development Bank, it will be 7.5%. According to IMF, it will be 9%. This is the expectation. Why are they giving such positive figures for India? Because they are saying that there is widespread vaccination coverage. So vaccination coverage of India has been appreciated across the world and they are saying Recovery of the economy directly depends upon the vaccination because if more people are vaccinated, they can go out for work to offices, industries will open, right? Plus, I taught you today that government of India has taken so many supply side related reforms. Those will help us to increase our production. It will help to grow. It will improve our GDP. Now, ease of doing business, export growth, all these things. Plus, our revenue is increasing. Our borrowings are coming down. This will also help us you know, to invest more in infrastructure. Because of these things, our growth is expected to be in decent figures. Fine. So, this was all for, for this year's chapter 1 of economic survey. See you soon with the next part in the series of economic survey analysis. Thank you so much.